<laughs> All right, have everybody welcome to Breaking Bread as we continue our um, study of the book of Hosea. I had a couple of updates on Linda. Several of you have reached out to Ron. Uh, he appreciates all the attention. She was able to come home. There was a little snafu like there usually is for the transferred her to a, a completely different hospital at the last minute. But ultimately, Linda is home. Uh, they do have a pick line in mm -hmm. her. Uh, Ron is, uh, don't be frightened by this, Ron is administering antibiotics through the pick line on a daily basis to his wife, Linda. And I'm thinking, what could go wrong with that? Um, <coughs> the infection is on her heart valve, her mit mm -hmm. mitral heart valve. And uh, so it's endocarditis. Ron educated me on what all that meant. Uh, they are hoping and we should be praying um, in agreement that the antibiotics administered through the line uh, do wipe out the bacteria on our heart and no further action is required. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't get any updates from Bill this week, but Bill is still dealing with some repercussions from the uh, mini stroke that he had. And so we need to keep uh, Bill in our prayers as well. Other than that, that's what I had. Um, oh, I did want to give you one other update. My friend down here, Paul, who had the um, hand surgeries, uh, I think he has had six now. Uh, they did close him up, and, but this time all seems to be going well. The infection, mm. his hand is starting to resume normal diameter. Um, and he just went to the hand doctor yesterday and the infectious disease doctor, and they are pleased with his progress. So if you just want to continue that, he gets full use of that hand back. It completely closes up. There's no more infections. Six surgeries is a lot of surgeries for the okay. same thing. They had to keep redoing it because of an infection. So uh, thank you for your prayers for Paul. Thank you for your prayers for Linda. Thank you for your prayers for, for Bill. I noticed Ned's still all braced up there. Ned, how are you doing? Oh, I'm fine. I had uh, physical therapy for the first time outside of the house just today, 7.30 this morning, and so I feel pretty good. They gave me a pretty good workout. I am uh, right at right at the crest of my nap time, so if I go to sleep and fall out of the chair, <laughs> <you got it. laughs> but I'm doing well, and thank, I'm thankful for that, and I want to thank once again to all of you for your prayers and everything. But Ned, I will gauge how uh, riveting I am in my teaching today by watching if your eyes are open or closed. Yeah. <laughs> it it um, doesn't put his cassette recorder on. <laughs> Jim, you're here. You're live. I see you. Yay. You made it in. Yeah. There's Paul. There's Paul. <clears throat> Where's Paul? Oh, there's Paul. Hey, Paul. Yeah, Paul's there. Dana, would you mind taking yourself off mute and opening us up in prayer this morning? Okay, glad to. Heavenly Father, we come to you today. As we always do, humbly, Lord, teach us. Teach us who our hearts are ready, our minds are willing. Lord, speak to us by your power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, through your word and, and music land as a vessel. So, Lord, we just de dedicate this time together to you, Lord. We also thank you for the healings you've already provided and you are still providing. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. 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 Thank you. All right, well, go ahead and mute Amen. yourselves, Amen. guys. Mute yourselves and go on over to Hosea 3. Uh, when I originally started to study for this week, uh, 3 is an extremely short chapter. I actually started to study 3 and 4. But as I got into three, I realized, oh, my goodness, there's so many multiple lessons in three. We're just going to do three, although we will finish uh, uh, early today. I only have three and a half pages of notes, which is low for me. Uh, go to verse one. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. Uh, two is kind of a summary chapter that forecasts what's going to happen for the rest of the book. Three gets into more details now of that journey. Um, again, when Hosea speaks. Uh, he's not only speaking from his heart, uh, relating to his personal situation with Gomer, his wife, but also he's, uh, 
he's reflecting God's heart and how God feels towards the people and nation of Israel and how they're treating him. Uh, so it kind of goes back and forth and you can apply it to both of them at equally at the same time. So let's get on with uh, Hosea three, verse one. And I'm just going to stop at verse one because it's a, it's a handful. Then the Lord said to me, so Hosea is speaking, God speaks to him, go again, love a woman who is loved by a lover and is committing adultery, just like the love of the Lord for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. Uh, let me just get the raisin cake thing out of the way so that it doesn't cause any of us. It's not a main point, obviously. It's not even one of your lessons. Uh, the Canaanite gods, they would offer food offerings to them as well. They would make these cakes uh, and embedded in the cakes would be dried grapes or raisins. Uh, so it, that just has to do with they're loving other gods and loving the, the foods that are given to other gods. That's all that means with the raisin case. Let's go back to the main message, though. He says, go again. God directs Hosea to do something that you have to imagine is incredibly difficult to do. He loves Hosea. It's debatable. We don't know for sure. Was she already a prostitute? Did she have a heart of harlotry but not yet acted on it? But in any case, she's with him and she leaves him. And she goes into this life of prostitution, either again or uh, just pursues the passions of her heart. Um, so he says, go after the woman who's loved by another lover, by a lover, and is committing adultery. Go after her, Hosea. God instructs him to do this. This wasn't in the past. This is happening current, present tense for Hosea. Um, and he says, go back, go get her, go love her. And I just, you got to imagine, not only did was he felt betrayed and stabbed in the back and so forth, but God says, no, I want you to put that aside and I want you to go back and I want you to get her. Now, it's not part of your main message, but one of the first lessons I want to talk about is this passage, because um, if you look at, I'm going to give you some references, Deuteronomy 24, 1 and Matthew 19, 7 and 8. Deuteronomy is uh, Moses talking. Matthew 19, 7 and 8 is Jesus talking, and it's talking about the subject of divorce. Um, when adultery breaks the marriage union, both Moses and Jesus in Matthew 19 said that that you were allowed to divorce based on adultery. However, I want you to notice this, and it's very clear from this passage that this shines a slightly different light on this topic. Allowing something is extremely different than commanding something. Okay? This clearly shows in Hosea, she's committed adultery. God doesn't command Hosea to dump her because of that. He actually commands Hosea to do the exact opposite. So if God commands us to divorce a spouse based on adultery, then he would go, go against this very command, his own command in Hosea. So, and God is not inconsistent. So Matthew 19, and I'm going to read it to you. I'll start in verse, verse three. Some Pharisees came to Jesus to test him. Now, that's the first thing you need to point out is they weren't really asking a question to gain knowledge or because they respected Jesus. They were asking a question to try to trip him up because they wanted to get him out of the picture. So these Pharisees asked Jesus, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any and every reason? Have, and, and Jesus replied, you know, sometimes I think Jesus was shocked at the ignorance of the religious leaders. He says, haven't you read that at the beginning, the creator made the male and female and said, 
For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but they are one. Therefore, what God has joined together, recognize this from, from uh, you know, different marriage vows, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Why then, the Pharisees pushed on him a little bit more. Why then did Moses command that a man give his wife a certificate of divorce and send them away? Here is the answer from the mouth of Jesus himself. Jesus replied, Moses, referring back to Deuteronomy, and now what he says, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives. Why? Because your hearts were hard. But then he says, but it was not this way from the beginning. So to, let me just be very clear about this. Divorce is allowed under very limited circumstances, but clearly between what Jesus is saying and what Hosea was commanding, the higher road, the higher road is the same one God took with Israel. The same one Hosea is now taking with Gomer in the story. It's all about forgiveness and restoration. You guys see that? And I know in who I'm talking to and you know from my own personal experience, very touchy issue. But when we go to the word of God for instructions, it's not confusing or contradicting at all. The high road is all about the way God relates to us when we commit adultery on him. Does he do this with us? Walk away? Divorce us? Nope. He, it's all about restoration, reconciliation, forgiveness. So is it permitted? Yes. Are you in sin because you follow through on that? Absolutely not. But God's laying down what the higher road is. Is there any... Any questions on this before I move on off of verse one? Okay. It, it doesn't really change it for me. I think what the main message you're giving is though, but I think I, I thought I saw a bunch of times that, or in certain translations that it said on, except for unlawful marriages. Not following you, Paul. Well, I guess that was that, that it, it didn't. Hmm. I'll tell you what, I will look for the translation and kind of and send it over to you and, and see if you came across it. Yeah, never saw that in any of the uh, scholars, commentaries or anything that I read on this this week. OK, it might be a slightly different verse then. OK. All right. Thanks. No, no worries. Mm -hmm. So just like God has love for the children of Israel. Um, you got to just. Put yourself in Hosea's shoes for a second. This is, we just read this like we're just reading it, like it's history. And it is history, but how difficult. I mean, this just, why did God command Hosea to go back to his still unfaithful wife? Guys, she had not, it's not like she's turned around and said, Hosea, please take me back. And he goes, oh, okay, uh, but boy, are you going to pay for it? She's still in the lifestyle. And he goes after her. Why did God do this? It's not just for the sake of Hosea and Gomer, but also so that for now and forevermore, this would be a living lesson of the Lord's relationship with his people. This is us. This is a picture of us. Israel and sometimes us were steeped in in types of spiritual adultery, yet the Lord still loves us and still pursues us. Do you guys get this? It doesn't make sense superficially, but when you see why God did this, it's a living lesson. And here come, here is your first lesson. When you think about how great God's love is towards us, how compassionate he is towards us, how forgiving he is towards us, how he pursues us 
even when we don't want to be pursued, our takeaway from that should be we need to be more compassionate. We need to be more loving. We need to be more forgiving towards other people that we relate to in our own lives. He, that's our model. Aren't we supposed to be modeling ourselves after that? All right, moving on, verse two and three. So now he does it, but this just this is really staggering. So, Hosea says, I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one half omers of barley. And I said to her, you shall stay with me many days. You shall not play the harlot, nor shall you have a man. So too will I be toward you. Now, there's a, there, that, that seems like a very odd statement at the end, but I'll explain it in a minute. But the first thing I want to talk about is the, the payment. Um, apparently, Gomer had sunk so low in this uh, lifestyle of prostitution that she had actually become enslaved to somebody else. Somebody had bought her, literally bought her and owned her not just for the night, but permanently. So he takes 15 shekels of silver. And by the way, one and a half omers of barley. Barley was actually in the Old Testament in these kind of passages. It's an actual insult. Barley was animal feed. It wasn't really even considered fit for human consumption. So, And the normal cost of a female slave was typically 30 shekels of silver. So uh, Gomer has sunk so low, basically, she's on a 50% off sale, right? So he, now, I don't know how this would have worked in their culture. Could he have gone back and demanded her because she's his wife? He didn't. He paid the man, the owner, this amount plus the, the barley and bought his wife back. Um, now, I, I saw this quote. I've heard this quote many times in my life. I don't know who originated this quote, the version I'm going to use. I'll give credit to Greg Laurie, uh, the, the guy that runs the Harvest Crusades and all. But this is a lesson to us about sin. Now, listen carefully, because this is really the way he phrased it is so perfect. And it's stuck with me for decades now. It's a lesson about sin. No doubt pleasurable at first sin will take you further than you wanted to go it will keep you longer than you wanted to stay and it will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay great quote great quote so jose obeys he takes back gomer his unfaithful wife and again just as a lesson, as a living life lesson, just like Yahweh is going to take back an unfaithful Israel. Um, now, the conditions of a return at first brush, it seems odd. It, he says, you're going to stay with me many days, which is an indeterminate period of time. We're not told how long that is. You're not going to be playing the harlot. You're going to be truthful, uh, true and faithful to me. He says, and you're not going to have a man. Uh, so too will I be to, toward you. So there's going to be this period of abstinence. We're not told, again, how long before that will end, but that is a condition of her returning. Now, the reason I believe God wanted us to, uh, uh, Hosea, to do this, again, is a symbol, a prophetic symbol to us, because Israel, remember, it never repents. The Northern Kingdom, it never repents from Hosea's message. Well, Steve brought this up and the, they never repented. And eventually the Assyrians came and wiped them out and carried them away. But remember from the previous two chapters that there is coming a time prophetically already told to us where not only the northern and southern kingdom will be joined back together, they will choose one head, which we already discussed was the Messiah. And this is all talking about this, and they'll prosper 
and grow and be planted in the land. And remember the one kid's name meant scattered, and now it's going to mean scattered as in they're going to be planted in this in their ground and grow and grow fruitful and how how God turned the three kids' names upside down and made them blessings instead of curses. And it's all this wonderful picture that we haven't seen yet. It's still in the future. It's not 1948. God's people are not really following him. They're a nation again. They're they're geographically located where they need to be, but this prophecy has not been fulfilled yet. And there's going to be this period of time of abstinence, and you're going to see this later on in today's verses, uh, before God is completely reunited with his bride Israel. Okay, just like Hosea and Gomer. So that's why you see this odd abstinence being dictated by Hosea to to Gomer. Um, This many days. Now, the point wasn't just to get Gomer out of her lifestyle of prostitution. The reason Hosea did this is he wanted to bring her home and bring her back into a, a, a relationship with himself as her husband. Now, notice in doing that, this takes two types of commitment. I love the word reciprocity because it really applies here. Um, This reciprocity of commitment is mutual. Obviously, Gomer has to agree to these terms. She's fallen really low. She's now a slave. She's willing to come back into probably blown away that Hosea would even have her back and that Hosea just paid money for her. And and she is going to have to commit to what? She's not going to be able to play the harlot anymore. But what? let's not forget Hosea's commitment, this reciprocity. He committed himself to remain faithful to Gomer, to support her, to care for her, to take care of her as his only wife and his only true love. So don't miss the two-way street there, what Hosea had to commit to as well. This brings us to our next lesson. We can only assume, oh boy, this I don't do well uh, if you're going to score me. By the way, it's a Dairy Queen cup. Um, Notice what Hosea, we are not told, but you can assume from this passage that Hosea did not hold a grudge against Gomer. Their home life did not look like this, did not look like this. Go, uh, Jose is constantly reminding Gomer, beating her over the head with the fact, look what you did. Look how you almost ruined our family. Look what you, uh, re, the example you provided to our kids, da, 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 and just held that over her constantly for the rest of their natural lives. Don't see that. We, we can see from the text that Hosea did what God said that he does for us because he is patterning a prophetic illustration of how God responds to his people. Let me ask you a question. How many of you guys, and we got an all guy today audience, how many of you guys sinned in the last week? Just raise your hand. Okay, unanimous. Is God the kind of God that looks at Lee and goes, yeah, no, we're, we're not talking. You did X, Y, and Z day before yesterday, and I'm still ticked off at you, and I'm not talking to you, Lee. Uh, forget about praying to me, by the way, because mm-hmm. your prayers aren't going to have any power right now until I, until I blow some steam off and forgive you. Is that how God deals with us? No. We're told that he forgives and he forgets. Now, does that really mean God's like, gee, I don't remember. What did Lee do? No, it means he willingly is, is, is going to take that sin and put it away from him. As far as the east is from the west, he's going to put it out of his mind and not beat Lee over the head with it all week long. He forgives and he forgets when we repent. And guys, we are to model this behavior in our relationships. Okay? We all got that? 
Okay. All right. Now, this many days, the reason it says this, and you're going to see it repeated here in this next passage, we aren't told how long this is. And the reason we it's left open-ended, like we, it did have a period of time where it would end, but we're not told how long it is, is because prophetically, um, Israel is going to go through this period of time before the Messiah comes, the second coming of Christ, and we don't know when that is. Now, I know there's books and movies and all this, and when's Jesus going to return? Uh, we do not, even Jesus doesn't know when he's going to return. Only the Father knows. So we're left with this indeterminate period of time, many days. And the same way with Hosea and Gomer, we're not told for a reason because it, it shadows what the prophetic is of God towards Israel. Um, now, What's interesting to me, and, and, and I hope nobody takes counterpoint on this because I didn't I didn't do enough reading to prove my point, but all the scholars and commentators that I read, which was probably 12 or 15 this week because I had questions about this, um, when you're talking about Israel, it means Israel is going to live for a very long period of time where we, we know it's been a several thousand years now without her ancient rites of religion. And yet, and yet, remember, Gomer said, you will not play the harlot. To my knowledge and to the scholars and commentators that I read, they have been absolutely stain free when it comes to following other gods to idolatry israel never went back to playing the harlot she really did learn her lesson between the babylonian exile and the assyrian conquest they learned the lesson they learned the lesson verse verse four for the children of israel should abide here's the word again many days without king or prince without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without ephod or teraphim, ephod, sorry, ephod or teraphim. So this really portrays Israel right up to our present day. N notice the characterization here. In, in my version, the word without is repeated five times. So Israel is without, period. What is she without? She, she's going to be without several things. First one is she has no monarchy. She has no prince. She has no king. She has no reigning monarch in the line of David. Uh, there's no one in the lineage to become Messiah uh, that's sitting on a kingdom inside Jerusalem. There is no such thing. And there hasn't been, in this case, for over 1,900 years. Ultimately, a monarch will come. As promised to David um, in 2 Samuel 7, there will be, and we know him to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords, but that hasn't happened yet. Um, number two, what are they without? They're without a sacrificial system. She, Israel, cannot observe this God-appointed sacrificial system during this long period of days, these period of many days and she still hasn't to this day but three and this is to her credit she will be without idolatry even though she's not going to uh, uh, observe any kind of true religious system like they used to have she will forsake idolatry and all of its components now judaism falls far short of christianity Judaism deals with the picture and Christianity deals with the reality, but still Israel will not fill its inherent void with idols or idolatry ever again. So they're not going to have a monarchy and no king, no prince. They're not going to have any sacrificial system to Jehovah, but yet there won't be idols or false gods. Um, so this describes Israel all the way back in the book of Hosea. Israel still had kings when Hosea was writing this. The northern kingdom had multiple kings. The southern kingdom of Judah had multiple kings. 
This was forecasting. This was prophesying. He said, you're going to go through a period of many days where you won't have anything. And we're still in those days. So that, that's kind of a goosebumpy moment because that actually happened and we live to see it and are living to see it. Last verse, verse five. Beautiful promise. Afterward, after what? After the many days, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They shall fear the Lord and his goodness in the latter days. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful promise that we talked a little bit about last week, about this time where everything will be made right, nature will be made right, beast uh, and prey will lie down together, uh, the crops will yield their fruit, people will get along, there's no more warfare, spear and bow are put away. This is talking about this, this after the coming of Christ and how everything will be restored back to the way it was supposed to be from the very get-go. Um, now, there won't be any of this happening until the Messiah returns, but this will mark their restoration um, when they turn back to the Lord. So, so far, this has been thousands of years. Uh, hasn't happened yet, but we're promised that it will happen. Now, one of the things I wanted to address, it's a small point. I don't want to make a big deal about it because this literally says, and David, their king. So some of the scholars believe that this prophecy is going to be literally fulfilled during the millennial reign of Christ here on earth and a resurrected David, literally David himself and his resurrected body will reign over Israel physically will be there. Uh, and, and there's different passages in Isaiah 55, Jeremiah 30, Ezekiel 34 that talk about this. Other Christian scholars and Jewish scholars uh, interpret this not as a reference to David, but as a reference to David's descendant, the Messiah, the one that's to come in the Davidic line, which, which we know to be Jesus. But it's the latter days refers to this messianic area. and there are multiple places in the Old Testament where the Messiah is called David. And they're used almost interchangeably to mean uh, they are two different people, but they're, the, the way they would describe the Messiah is David. But it, it, what they were really saying is in the line of David. So it doesn't matter whether this is literal or this is figurative describing the Messiah. The fact is Israel will be at peace. The northern and southern kingdom join together. There will be no more war. There'll be no more hatred. There will be no more famine. There'll be no more killing. Um, this is this beautiful promised time. And they're one of the reasons that we look forward to the second coming of Christ on this earth. So this national regeneration that's going to happen with Israel will cause them to seek the king that God always intended them to, for them to have, which is the Messiah. It's at this time, and this is kind of cool, guys, that all of God's unconditional promises that he made for Israel, that he gave to Abraham back in Genesis 12, all come true. Every last one of them. They'll all be completely and completely fulfilled. Completely and ultimately fulfilled. So that's pretty convincing proof to me that replacement theology is wrong that God is not done with the nation of Israel. I don't know how you can read these passages. You wouldn't, ha you'd have to just ignore entire swaths of the Old Testament to see that God is not done with Israel. This is why we need to continue to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We need to pray for the protection of Israel, for the blessing of that nation and people, because God's not done with them yet. God is not done with them yet. All right, we've got about a minute. Uh, when we come back, we are done with uh, chapter three, but I have your main message uh, that we'll come back to. So when you come back here in about a minute, uh, don't put yourselves on mute. Keep yourselves off of mute and we'll go through this main message and then we'll finish early for today. I'll see you back here in about a minute. Okay.